Okay, well, we're coming towards the end of this, of the, the book of Revelation, this very, to say the least, unique prophetic writing. Um, I, I won't do too much reference to some of our introductory statements for this writing, and, and that being related to the nature of this book, the spiritual nature of this book, and the ongoing unfolding of the truth that is contained in this book. Um, I was mentioning to Noah last night that <coughs> this, the writing in the way that Jesus relayed this, this information to the Apostle John and then ultimately the spiritual nature of what is being conveyed in, in relation to the purpose of God is very expansive. So, you know, I, I thought when I was coming to this, this session this week and even looking forward to it, I thought, oh, you know, we will we'll go ahead and just close up Revelation and, you know, finish that study and, you know, that'll be the end of that. And then I had a really difficult time making it past the first few verses of this chapter because – uh, not because there was some kind of a block or hindrance, but because the way that uh, things are written in this book are inclusive of so much that has already been written in the book. And it's not just inclusive of this particular writing, <clears throat> but of the whole of scriptures and even more so the whole of God's work from the beginning of time, from before time. And. This will definitely be a, a, a point, you know, the Lord has been very gracious to me in teaching you guys to, to bring some significant truths along the line. There were a number of points throughout this study that I had already, actually before I, I started the study, had determined, you know what, I, I'm definitely not going to try and teach anything that the Lord does not really solidify in my spirit. As, as truth, I don't want to, to, to have any conjecture or make any guess um, as to the meanings, uh, prophetic or spiritual meaning, um, with anything. You know, I want you guys to be able to see um, truth as it is. I also, you know, did not intend to, to take as close of a look as we have. That was not my plan at all. But the truths that are being revealed throughout this writing have become so relevant to our present time and day. Now, someone, if someone was listening to this recorded session for the first time, then their immediate response to that statement may be, yeah, you know, look at all the things that are going on in the world and, you know, prophetic timelines are being fulfilled and things like that, and they're directly correlating that to world events and certain world leaders and wars and rumors of wars and all those things. You know, Jesus talked about this very time of man's history as well, saying, yes, all that will come. But it, <clears throat> he also said there's, a, there's something greater happening. And he wanted to, to, to point to the greater work of God throughout history. And he did not neglect uh, at all uh, the circumstantial things that would happen in the earth. Um, neither do I want to neglect those things, but I also am not trying to predict those things, nor am I trying to place a finger on them currently. There is a spiritual work that God is doing, and um, the spirit of revelation, and I don't mean that, I'm not using that word just because of the book we're studying, is really bringing depth and breadth and practical application to the fulfillment of God's will in the midst of his people. That's something that we've seen and pointed at throughout this study. <clears throat> As we come to the end of this particular writing, we are definitely coming into a phase of, of incompletion, which means there are a number of things that we have in the last few chapters and 
and to the finish of this book, you know, we are we have not seen the fulfillment of those things spiritually yet or in the earth. And so, you know, as I committed before, I don't want to go into any any type of conjecture about those things. And while there are things that are surrounding our current spiritual circumstance and timing in the Lord that are very relevant to the things that we have studied. There are things that God and, and Emmanuel and I had a short discussion about this last night. Uh, you know, there are things that God has yet to reveal. There are things within the, the imagery, imagery and words that are described by John the Apostle here, written by what he witnessed in spiritual vision that in a sense have not yet been un unlocked. Yes, and we will see even in the next this chapter and the next that John was very specifically instructed to write these things down. Other scriptures indicate similarly that certain things are written down in this way for a people who don't yet exist. And I'm not saying that directly applies to us or not. My, my point is that there are things that God and this is one of the, the very subjects that we spent some time on early on in this in our study of Revelation. There are very specific times that God has allotted for certain truth to be fully understood and revealed. When I speci say specific times, I do not mean that God is tied to a date on our Gregorian calendar. So that on whatever today is, August 25th at 9.27 in, you know, nine minutes or eight minutes, then God will have, you know, assigned his, his moment. You know, God is, is not attached to time in the way that a, a clock tells time. You know, we have, um, this will be a more pertinent illustration for my, for my kids. I, I had this <coughs> clock that was my grandmother's that I remember when I was a very little child in her home and when we first moved out here to the beach um, and we were in Austin for a few months, I, I found it at my parents' house and they allowed me to take it because I wanted to have it repaired. Well, I just got it repaired and we've, we've, it's, uh, we, we put it on the wall here, um, you know, a week ago or so. And um, it's a cuckoo clock. So it tells time, but then on the half hour and hour marks, there's a, there's a special little mechanism that begins to move inside that clock and it causes this little bird to come out and some little air bellows inside to make noise and it's a it's a fun little thing but my 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 point is that god is not tied to time in the way that that little birdie is <laughs> you know he created time and god's timing is not about the right gears lining up on a calendar and something else that we're going to see in this chapter is actually that those, that order of life, that way of existence, that way of interpreting what our lives mean in what is coming is literally going to change. It's going to pass away. That's one of the very first things that's communicated um, in this chapter uh, and towards the end of the chapter as well. And so... In that sense, you know, much of what is being described as a fulfillment here is a, it's not it's like we think of fulfillment and ending as something that kind of closes itself up and becomes complete and finished. But fulfillment in God's plan is something that is ever expansive. <laughs> it's hard to explain that. And so and I'm, hard, I'm having a hard time describing what I have seen, spiritually speaking, about this the unfolding of this latter time because in my heart and my mind as i entered into it it just it, it expanded rapidly you know like the expanse of the universe and i was like wow this got really big really fast there's so much involved and there's so much that is perpetually and ongoing in relation to what's being described here so as we said from the beginning of the study, Revelation is not a study about the end. It's a study about the fulfillment of God's purpose for creating man. And once man finally comes into his 
the fulfillment of his purpose, then we're only seeing the beginning of what God set out to do. And that's something else that we're going to see very early on in this in this chapter. So I'm looking forward to to to, to getting into this a little bit and and uh, but only as far as the Lord is allowed. So I'm trying to give that as a little bit of a context and pre-qualifier for our session today. Um, so without further ado, then let's look at Revelation chapter 21. Um, we will continue to see um, similar imageries. I think somebody's coming in the office uh, as to what we have in previous some of the previous chapters where a lot of the focus has been what is going on or who has what seat of authority? Where is the reigning authority, the ruling authority coming from and who who is it? And so, you know, starting from around chapter 12, we saw the unseating of Satan. We saw the attempt uh, and, and when I say we saw, you know, I'm not I'm not speaking towards global events. I'm just speaking towards what we have gone through in the study of these scriptures. <clears throat> the devil cast down to the earth, the rising up of the beast out of the sea, the rising up of the beast out of the earth, their influence on the peoples of the earth and the ruling authorities of the earth, the deception that take place. And then we see this great division between two different peoples. It, quite simply, those who ultimately receive the mark, the number, that being the character and nature of the beast, and those who receive the mark of the Lamb of God on their foreheads. They were set apart, having taken on themselves the mind of Christ. Up even until this last chapter, we see the uh, the battle between, and we we continue to see the comparison of what is happening with these two two different groups of people, and ultimately we see that there is some further division. Uh, and that was in Revelation chapter twenty, uh, in verse four, after Satan has been bound. John says that he saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given the authority to judge. And who were they? They were those who had uh, been partakers of the first resurrection. And we've mentioned this comparison before. It'll come in uh, to play again today. That being what is directly mentioned here in Revelation uh, as the first resurrection and also what is called the second death. So the first resurrection and the second death, you know, the first record, having something labeled as the first implies that there can be a second. There is another, okay? And calling something a second means that there was a first. And so we'll touch very lightly on that today because there's a bit of a mystery there um, that I think the Lord has yet to, to fully, fully reveal, to me anyway. So I'm not going to attempt to offer explanation beyond what I do understand. So we know that those who, in essence, died this first death will be raised to newness of life, and they will reign with Christ. This was all described in, um, uh, in uh, chapter 20, and that says that uh, in verse 4 continually, it says, They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years, and it clearly says the rest of the dead did not come into life until the thousand years were ended. And then he describes that specifically in verse 5, saying, this is the first resurrection. The blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection. And then he quickly says, the second death has no power over them. Might as well touch on it briefly now. The first death then, you know, in my understanding, would be the death that we die to ourselves, to the world, to the ways of the world. Thereby allowing that spirit and life of Christ to reign in us. And because Christ has been allowed to reign in us through that first death, then we are then raised to newness of life to reign with him during this time. So, again, you can see in this study, I'm not going to discuss things like the millennial reign, which is what this describes, when that happens, whether it's happened yet or not, whether it will happen or yet, you know, all those things. 
are not irrelevant, but they are not applicable to our particular focus in Revelation. Why? Because we are looking at specifically the spiritual work that Christ has and is and will accomplish in, with, and through his people. And yes, that is being made to be compared with uh, the other remaining people and spiritual entities in the world. So up to this point, we have also seen that the, the, the beast that came out of the sea and the beast that came out of the earth, which was later called the false prophet, have been uh, – their, their authority and power has been taken away. Um, and now we see in, in uh, chapter 20 uh, the thousand years uh, where Satan uh, has been uh, first bound and then released. He goes on to continue um, to deceive. And then it says in verse 10 of chapter 20, And the devil who deceived them at this point was taken, and he was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And they were where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then we see the great judgment coming. So all will come before the white throne. All will come before the great judgment. Nothing will remain. And those who are found to be in the book of life will receive life. And those, everyone else will be judged, it says, by what they had done. In other words, by the way that they lived their life. And then ultimately, finishing chapter 20, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And then it here says the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the actual nature of the lake of fire, we're not going to discuss uh, too much. Again, this is primarily spiritual language. You know, there, will there be a separation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Will there be a in that separation? Um, it's one of the the, the, the very uh, most basic understandings and meanings of that is that you will be cast out of God's presence. There are other scriptures that describe those who have been in such a place, and it's not a pleasant, not a pleasantry. Okay. But then we see the unfolding of the blessing for God's people, and that's where we're coming into Revelation uh, 21. So that was just a short re review of what has happened up to this point, and now we're going to see a further explanation, expansion of how things will progress from that point. So in John's vision, 21.1, now he says, Then I saw a new heaven. In a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. The word for new here can have two different uh, uh, meanings, not so different from one another, but you have something that can be new in form. Uh, and so in this case, that would mean that it's, it has been recently made or recently created. And then you can also have something that is new in substance. In other words, it is a new kind. It's something that's never been seen before. So we can create something new that is new because it has been recently made, uh, and but maybe it had already existed before. So I, let's say I had a cup and it was broken, and so we went and we made another cup. But that was not something new to us. It was just something new because it was recently made. It hadn't been used before. And I think more of what we're looking at here is something that is of a new substance, <laughs> okay? So the second definitive, uh, second way of defining new. It's something that has never been seen before. It's a new kind, a new herd, uh, something that has uh, never been seen or heard of before. And this correlates to what's also um, uh, mentioned in the last part of verse 4, which we will read down to, but let's briefly bring that in. The second, the last part of the verse, of verse four says, "For the old order of things has passed away." So what was what was former, the old order has now passed away. Okay, and um, the, the the Greek word there is apokomai, uh, 
and, and part of the root word is um, an, another word. I know the Greek language is not something that anyone expects to remember, but just so that you know what I'm looking into, the, the Greek word katargeo means to do away with or to pass away. Okay, and in reference to this, uh, let's briefly turn over to um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, because there's a correlation to the use of this word here. Paul talking about the new covenant and the life that it produces. Now we see here in Revelation the fulfillment of the life that this new covenant will produce, okay? Both in the lives of men and in having an effect on all of creation. 2 Corinthians 3, 7, Paul says, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of, the Moses, of Moses because of its glory, Fading though it was, and the, the, the word here in the fading is, uh, is this word katargeo, which means it's passing away, to, to do away with it. Fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? So uh, he continues, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And that's part of what I've seen um, in the unfolding of God's purpose here in Revelation. It further says, and if what was fading away, so here again we have that katargeo, if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts. And that's some interesting word usage uh, in this context because we are going to later see as the city of God is described that those things that had a former glory, like the lights in the sky, the sun and the moon, will they will they will become they will fade in comparison with the glory of God that is expressed in the midst of the city of God and will become for it its guiding light, its provision of light. And so this is all tying together in this pa in the beginning of this uh, chapter about this the, the passing of an old order, an old way of life, and even an old substance of life, and the not just the renewal, but the bringing in uh, Jesus Himself here. Uh, and there's a reference to it where the words of Christ are, "Behold, I will make all things new." And that newness is not I'm bringing back something that had been broken or messed up, and I'm going to do it again. The newness there is, and, and Isaiah saw this too, you know, the Lord said, behold, I do a new thing, something that you don't know of, something you haven't heard of, something you've never seen before. So I just want to reiterate that that's the kind of new that we're talking about here. So that's verse 1. So he says he sees the new heaven and the earth, new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer <clears throat> any sea. Again, this is figurative. So the nature of humanity is the sea of humanity has changed as well. There was no longer any sea. Verse two, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So again, you know, I think that there are those who, who try to argue, well, you know, you shouldn't over allegorize or, you know, you, you shouldn't always think that everything in Revelation, for instance, there's a mixture of what is literally described and what is figuratively or allegorically described. And I think that we, we can see just by the mixture of the language that is used here that when a bride, which is a, you know, in our minds, uh, in, in our physical understanding, uh, uh, you know, a female, a woman coming down, but then it's described as a city. OK. And so we know that the language that is being used here is figurative. So what is really being described here when John says that he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from from God prepared, it says as a bride. 
beautifully dressed for her husband. So we see a heavenly order from above, which is where is this city coming from, this, this city adorned like a bride coming from? Well, remembering the previous chapters, we know that she or it is coming from the highest ruling place, the throne of God. So coming down with an order from above. So he just explained the old things have passed away. There's a new order. And at the same time, here it comes. It's coming from heaven, from the throne of God. All right. And it is it is ordained like a bride. What does that mean? That it means it, that it is it is properly and fitly ordained and dressed. It, it, it's fully prepared to to fulfill its role. OK. Verse three, and I heard a voice from the throne saying, now the now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. So God's tabernacle, his dwelling, his abode, his house, his residence. His residing presence will be with them. The word <clears throat> that is used there is uh, the, the, the Greek word with is meta, which means to be among, to be amid, or to be with. Uh, briefly, let's jump back to uh, Matthew <clears throat> because I want you to see something that was – told about the, the, this life of God in Jesus Christ early on. And it is in Matthew, let's look at uh, chapter 1, verses 22 to 23. Verse 22 says, at, at this, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, that was going to be the name of the child, and the name of that child was also representative of a new kind of life, and not ultimately for that one child, but for the people of God. What does the name mean? Not God is with him. It doesn't mean he is God. It means God is with us. And the word that is a, a root in the word of Emmanuel is <coughs> this word meta, which means to dwell with. So among, uh, uh, God, Emmanuel means God with meta us. All right. Now we see the fulfillment of that promise because of the life that Jesus lived. Because of the life that was manifest in him, this is the same author, okay, uh, wrote, uh, and, and you guys I'm sure remember this when we studied um, the epistles of John, the apostle John. And uh, he mentions both in his gospel as well as in the epistles that he was a firsthand witness of this life. In 1 John 1, 1, he says, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at with our hands and have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life, this, this kind of life appeared, and we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has made itself known. It has appeared to us. And he says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. So now we see the fulfillment, what this life was meant to produce in and for and ultimately through God's people. And this is what we are seeing now in this picture that's being described here in Revelation 21 with the city of God <clears throat> coming down from heaven from God adorned like a bride. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will be in their midst. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order 
of things has passed away. All things made new. Now, verse 5 takes us back to this description of who is on the throne. Verse 5, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he told John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Okay? Uh, if you want to write down just a couple of scripture references in relation to what has been prophetic, excuse me, prophetically spoken about making all things new, Isaiah 43 and verse 19, also in Isaiah 42, verse 9. And then uh, a good majority of Isaiah 65 as well. Verse 6 is very intriguing. I think you're going to enjoy some of the truth that comes through this. Let's read verse 6 first. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water of life. Interesting how this is translated. I'm trying to look over here at the the um, uh, the the what was this the passing translation, and in verse six, it says here. Then he said to me, "It has been accomplished, for I am the beginning and the end." Okay. Now, interesting when I when I dug into the language a little bit, uh, th there's a combination of, of meanings and ideals here. But the, the word it is, it, it, is, it is done is, again, we think of it because of how we think of Revelation in particular. We think of it as this ending of all things. It's done. It's over. Okay? It's done. It's finished. But that's not what's being said here. What actually is being said is it has come to be. That's just incredible to me. Okay? So we're looking at, again, let's put into context what has just been said, what John is seeing in this vision. Then I saw a new heavens and a new earth. The old has passed away. The new has come. And what's being said here in this, what's translated as it is done is in observation of this new thing, look, here it is. It is done. It has come to be. That's what it really means. It has finally come to be. It has come upon the stage. It is now appearing in history. So what is done, what is being done here is what God has always wanted to see come to be has now come to be. But it's only a beginning. So again, it, it's amazing to me that th through all the translation history and the theology that drives and the doctrine that has driven the interpretation of scriptures has not been in, it has not, it, the standard of God's eternal purpose has been absent from it. Now, fortunately, the spirit is very keen to see these things made known. Because the new way, the new life, the new order is what is now coming to be. And that's, that's very directly described here in the scriptures. So I want to say again, that the NIV says it is done. Even the uh, Passion tra uh, Translation says it is accomplished, which is much closer, okay? What is, what is accomplished? I am finally able now, God is saying, I am finally able now to present what I've always want to present, to bring it about, to make this new thing appear. Not... I'm fixing something or renewing something or br making new again something that was broken, but I'm bringing on the stage something that has never been seen and observed before. Similar language in scripture is used. Paul used it when he was talking about the new covenant again. He said, no eye has seen, in quotation of Isaiah, no ear has heard, heard no mind has conceived what God has in store for his people. Then the ultimate, then the question quickly arises, well, then what is it? Now he continues there and says, but God has revealed it to us, the apostles, through and by his spirit. And we can't even imagine how wonderful it is. So now we come to this point in Revelation through written by the apostle John, 
who, hearing the Lord in this and seeing this happen in the vision, says, here's what it is. This is what has come to be now at this time. It has come to be. I will make it known. Uh, the, uh, Paul refers to that in, in many different of his in many different uh, epistles as well. But I wanted us to have some clarity about what's being done there because our minds immediately say, oh, yes, this is revelation. It's about the end of all things. So here's another end. No, something new is now allowed to begin to function. And what is the order in it? You know, he continues there. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of water of life. Is that not the same message that Jesus brought when he said, come to me who, uh, if you're thirsty and I will give you water. And anyone who drinks of this water in him, a wellspring of life will come up. He was talking about a new form of life, a new flow of life, a new source of life. So what is it if we're asking now if, it, if this really means it has come to be what has come to be? And that's what was just being described. It is this new order, this new rule and way of life. If we want to use the word that we commonly use in many of our discussions, this culture has now been established and it's going to begin to function. OK, now the Lord knows the beginning from the end. So let's look at a couple of. Uh, scriptural references first in Isaiah 46 in relation to these things. Isaiah 46. Start in verse 8. Remember this. Fix it in the mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. <laughs> Remember the former things, those of long ago. So again, speaking of the former things, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Verse 10, I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So we're seeing in Revelation here the fulfillment of God's purpose. From the east I summon a bird of prey and from far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. Interesting that we just looked in the last two chapters at the great battle where the Lord himself called all the birds of prey to come and feed on the flesh of the kings of the earth and those who had the mark of the beast. What I have said and I, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Now, hear the fulfillment and the joy in God's heart here in Revelation when he says, here it is. I've done what I said I was going to do. Listen to me, verse 12, back in Isaiah. You stubborn hearted, you who are far from righteousness, I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor, my glory to Israel. Now, we're going to see further described in the latter part of this chapter that it is the glory of God, the splendor of God, that becomes the light for this city. And that light is not just for this city, but for all the nations. Uh, let's turn now to Isaiah 55 in correlation to some of the other things that were uh, mentioned here in this, this last verse that we looked at. 55.1. Come all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, Come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. 
Hear me that your soul may live and I will make an everlasting and eternal covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. So here we see him saying, here has come this new way of life. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Verse 7, he who overcomes the overcomer will inherit all of this. And I will be his God and he will be my son. What is the established relationship in this new culture? In what has newly been created and come and has now come onto the stage as a way of life formally presented by God? The relationship between father and son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I believe the King James says they will have their part in the fiery lake of burning sulfur or in the lake of fire and brimstone. This is the second death. So the comparison here again is the new life, the new order itself becoming the fulfillment of the judgment against or the passing away of the former way, the judgment of the former way and all of those who are participants and partakers of it. The overcomer, new way of life. The old way passing away with judgment. So I refer again to that illustration that we've used in the last couple sessions, excuse me, that being of that which causes the separation between the wheat and the tares. By the fruit that is born, you will know the difference. Now verse 9. So again, we're going to see as we have throughout this writing, kind of a, re a reiteration take place. So something is described and then it's described again in greater detail. We saw at the very beginning of this chapter, he saw the new heavens and the new earth. Now he's going to be shown that again, but with more detail. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls of the seven last plagues came down to me. Now this is compared to what we see and we looked at this when we were in chapter 17. 17 verse 1, one of the angels who had the seven bowls came and showed to me, come, I will show you the punishment the of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now, similar scenario, this angel, one of the angels who had one of the seven bowls came and said, I'm going to show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And again, he is carried away in the spirit. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain Previously had been taken to a wilderness, a desert. Now he's taken to a mountain, great and high. Remember, we have said many times that in the last days, the Lord said that his temple would be established as chief among the mountains, among the highest places. So again, we're talking about where the ruling authority resides. And now he's going to be shown the wife, the bride of the lamb in this way. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. So he said, I'm going to show you the bride. And then what does he show him? The holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So we can see this very obvious reiteration of what the be was in the beginning of the chapter. It's shown. Now, here's the detail. It's shown with the glory of God. It's shown with the glory of God. Oop, I lost my place here. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. Now, this is the same jasper which we described early on when John saw the throne of God and the rainbow around it. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. Okay? So... Let me continue. And with the 12 angels at the gates, on the gates were written the names of the tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. 
And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So much of what we are seeing here is described as, um, obviously these details and they're, they have a lot of meaning behind them. I think this is primarily speaking toward, and ultimately as he continues with this description all the way through uh, the end of the chapter, he's speaking more towards the heavenly order and function that takes place in this city. And these various descriptions of precious metals and stones and jewels and the gates and the comings in and the coming out and the closing and the opening of doors and the light that shines within is indicative. It, it is pointing at the functionality or the order that functions as a process, as a way of life in the midst of the city. So obviously that's a lot of mysterious language there that I don't, that I don't fully understand. Now verse 15. We do know this, that we are being shown the true bride as viewed from the realm of the spirit. And we know that this holy city, this bride is a people. Okay, now coming into um, verse 15, there's a, an interesting uh, word usage here. It says, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And then he goes on to describe the measurements of the city all the way in its measurements uh, through the next couple of verses. And then he goes back into the materials of which it was made all the way through verse 21. The word that I wanted to point out here is because it's been used in different contexts and it's actually different words that have different meanings, but a, sim a similar connotation. And I, I did a brief word study that is not extensive at all. In fact, I'm not going to share all of it with you, but I do want to just take some of the highlights. And the word here is rod, the rod. OK, there are two different rods. Uh, this particular that are th that words, excuse me, that are translated as rod in English, but they're actually different words in the original languages. And so the word that is used here is not rod, actually, it's reed. OK, it can be translated as rod, but the use it's the use behind each that, that I want us to see. Because we see earlier in the chapter, it says that. Uh, they will, uh, and, and that was in uh, chapter uh, 11, uh, no, where was it earlier on? It says that, they, that he would destroy them with the rod of his mouth. Uh, where was, oh, I missed my chapter here. Here we go. It was in chapter 19, talking about the sword of his mouth and uh, earlier um, the rod of iron. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's a different word. Okay, so let's just briefly look at these two because the meanings behind them and their correlation to the life of, of Christ in particular are interesting to me anyway. So there's the first word is, uh, I'm going to give you both the, the Greek and the Hebrew version of the same word because, because the New Testament authors um, quoted many Old Testament prophets and the languages of the two testaments were a little different as they as they came to be when you have that kind of crossover then you can make these comparisons with the word usage so the Greek word that's used for reed here is kalamos which means reed sta uh, rod staff or pin it's the stem of a plant interestingly it is by this this reed and this is where I want us to see some of this comparison <laughs> because Jesus, when they put the crown of thorns, so here in all this description, we're talking about who has authority, those who wear crowns, those who are seated in seats of authority. And, and then Jesus ultimately comes to reign and rule by the rod. OK, he will rule with a rod of iron, with the, the rod, the, the standard that comes from him out of his mouth. But interestingly, it was the reed that was used uh, it, uh, on Jesus. So when they put the crown of thorns on his head, it was the kalamos reed with which they used to strike him on the head many times. 
okay? And they, you know, smashing the thorns as a mockery of his kingship, okay? Um, this is also referred, the same word usage um, is used uh, in 11.1, 1, okay, where John himself says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told to go measure the temple of God. Interestingly here, we are seeing the same reed now of gold being used to measure the city, okay? So it was the same word usage reed with which Jesus was struck on the head uh, against the crown of thorns. It was also the same word reed that was used that they said that they put the bitter, the bitter gall, the vinegar on the sponge, and they placed it on the end of a reed, and then they extended it up to Jesus for him to drink when he was thirsty, okay? The Hebrew version of the same word for reed okay, is kane, okay, which root is kalamus. Interestingly, that's the Greek word that is used is kalamus. But the root word of the, the Hebrew, kane, is kalamus, which means aromatic reed. It's used as a measuring rod or a shaft for a lampstand or a branch, okay? Now, uh, just a couple of scripture references along this line. Uh, in Ezekiel, Ezekiel Daniel, it says before. Ezekiel 40. Man, time's flying today. Verse 3. It says, he took me, and again, this is in reference to the measuring of the temple. And that's why I'm taking a little bit of time to expound on this word because while I don't fully understand all the functions that are being spiritually described with the words that are used, and there is something about uh, the application of this rod that is very important. He took me there and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze, and he was standing in the gateway with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. Verse 4, this is Isaiah or Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3 and 4. The man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears and pay attention to everything I'm going to show you, for this is why I've been brought here. Tell the house of Israel everything that you see. And then he begins to describe the new temple area for the, for the whole remainder of uh, not only this chapter, but the next three chapters in Ezekiel uh, in 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 a very similar order is expressed all the way up through chapter 44 in Ezekiel if you want to read on that a little bit uh, uh, as a, a greater context for what's being described here uh, in, in these verses of Revelation 21. But back to this, this word, okay? So the, the, the root uh, this, it, it, of this word, kane, is kana, all right? And this root means to acquire or ob to obtain wisdom and knowledge. And this is correlated to this word read, the measuring stick. Okay? It also means to be bought. So to cause to possess, all right, or to redeem. So some of the uh, um, imagery behind this word read is to measure, to teach, to instruct, to write. And to record. All right. Now I want to go because this just came to my mind uh, back briefly to uh, Isaiah uh, chapter eleven because this is uh, a different reference. There's a third reference to rod here, which is I just want to bring into the mix here, but. 11.1 1 of Isaiah says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. This rod or shoot is a completely different word than both of the words we're looking at, which is choder. And this word choder is specifically meant to be in reference to offspring or a descendant. Okay? Now, what I was actually thinking was, I wanted to, it was in, uh, is it, Brother Emmanuel, can you help me with the reference here? Is it, uh, where in Kings 
Oh, uh, excuse me, it's not Kings. It's uh, Samuel. Is it First Samuel 7 where he's talking, or no, where the promise of, that comes to David about his son, uh, the, where the Davidic covenant is made. Where is that? That should be in Samuel. Second Samuel seven somewhere. Yep. I think a four or five chapter. It's I'm seven. Not sure, how it was done. It's seven. Um, now okay. it, let's look at this really carefully because this this I, I didn't even bring into my word study, but the Lord just brought it to my mind. Uh, so in God's promise to to um, uh, David. He says this, and this, this word of the Lord came to Nathan, and this is uh, 2 Samuel 7 and now verse 5. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? Now, what are we talking about? God's dwelling is now with his people, his abode, his home, his tabernacle. I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I've moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and and following the flock to be ruler over my people. So this is important because now we're looking in this last several chapters, who has the ruling authority? Now, we know that Jesus is the Lion of Judah, directly speaking to him as a descendant of David. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you, which at this point in Revelation has actually happened. All the enemies have now been cut off. They've been cast into the lake of fire, burning sulfur. And now I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. That's going to be actually what's described in the remainder of this chapter. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore. The later part of this chapter explicitly states those who are impure or wicked or rebellious will not enter into this city as they did at the beginning and have done ever since I appointed leaders over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Now let's focus on this next couple of verses. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring. Now that's that other word, choder, to succeed you who will come from your own body. So this is a direct correlation of this third word, choder, as meaning a descendant. And I will establish his kingdom. Verse 13. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. So again, a direct reference to this relationship that is mentioned here in Revelation 21 as the new way and order and it says when he does wrong i will punish him with the rod of men with floggings inflicted by men interestingly that we see this happen all the way up to the death of christ now this other word that is used because it's a almost like a a, a reversal and there's a mixture that's there in second samuel jesus received both rods in a sense both the reed and the rod the reed he says here he will in a sense he will punish him with the rod he will the instruction will come through it so again the 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 calamus the uh kana reed the in the the meaning behind it uh, the meanings behind it are to measure to teach instruct write and record so it's also that same reed is used as a pen Okay, now let's look at this other word briefly. I'm sorry this is taking so long, but there's, there's some important things here. The other word here in the Greek for rod is rabdos, okay? This meaning is staff or walking stick, a twig, a rod, or a branch, okay? And the, in the, it infers directly to that with which someone is beaten, okay? It's also 
a reference uh, the, the, the rod in this sense is also correlated directly to the royal scepter, so having to do with ruling authority, okay? The, the root word here is, in, you know, you, if you can imagine me holding a stick and hitting the table and that rapping sound, that's where this word comes from. It's from the rap of the strike, okay? So the root word literally means to strike or to let fall, to rap, to smite, or to slap. And it's directly correlated to the sound that it makes, okay? The Hebrew version of this word is shebet, which means the same thing. Rod, staff, scepter, it also can mean tribe, okay? So the, the use here, as compared to the first one, kalamos, the reed, Measure, teach, instruct, write, record, okay? This one, the, 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 the word usage means to be used for beating or striking, okay? Or for correction and ruling, okay? I, I want to bring that into context because when we see the overcoming of Christ and the battles and we see the proceeding of the, or the extension of the scepter, his rod, then we know that it's specifically meant to strike down something and to hold over the rule, the ruling authority. But now we see the reed being used as a measurement, a standard that is being laid out, okay, for what? The city of God. It has also been previously, not only in the same book of Revelation, but in other pro prophetic words, it is the reed, the measuring rod that is used to take measurement of the temple mount, the order within the temple, and now we see here also of the city of God. The reason I bring this up is because some of the, the, the more mysterious language that is used in describing this city of God that's coming from, the, from heaven to earth, the city of Jerusalem, the bride of Christ, it's pointing towards its function. And now we see this golden measuring rod being used to measure the city. So again, the measurement that's being applied, applied it implies that the way that the standard is, is met out, the way that the city is measured is through teaching and instruction, okay? That's really what I wanted to come down to, that there's an order at work here, and there's a way that it is put into place and that's being applied here. So can I can I add something to Yes, that? please, so brother. This, in the Jewish culture, when the young man or the son to, you know, they are patriarchal tradition, they are family, they all call themselves his own, his God's own people, right? So there's a patriarchal order. In a sense, every son is a son. To Abraham, to God, therefore. So they have this ordinance through their tradition. When a young man, first born, imagine, coming of age 12, he will then consider as a legal citizen of the society, if you will. It's like we, you know, certain age able to drive, certain able, certain age consider as uh, able to road. In this one, 12, I believe they were able to study the Torah, mm. to be instructed. So if there is a expectation, the stature that a boy, how high he is. And in the Jewish culture, in those traditions, they normally use a steak or something to measure a, a, a average boy's height. He will give you a, a height, you know, it's a man, a young man's stature, basically. It's also an age, you know, 12 months each year. When they are 12, they have been laid 144 months. So it's a number for man and a height of man. Here, God uses this measurement to try to illustrate this is not a physical temple mm -hmm. or physical city building. Mm. It's a building with a living stone, means his song. This is a city of his song, basically. But there is an order to it. So, right. go ahead, brother. Yeah. Amen. All right, yeah, I was, even as you were speaking and you're, you're talking about that age, you know, the Proverbs, Solomon said in Proverbs, 
do not spare the rod from your children. You know, there, there, and, and God himself said that to, to David about his own son and the application of that rod, not only, as you mentioned, as, as, a, as a measurement um, mm-hmm. of, of stature and maturity, but also mm-hmm. as an application for correction and Absolutely. teaching. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and David referred to that also in uh, Psalm 23 when he said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So we have these different applications. <laughs> so the rod, correction, the staff, mm-hmm. leading, and instruction. So it's a really yeah. amazing to see that in, in, in here we see here God is saying here is the new order. The, the old has passed away. The new order has come. Here's how it is applied. Here's yeah. how it will function. And that's hard to read when you're just reading, you know, precious jewels and Jasper and Onyx and, you know, all this words that are here. But what I want you guys to see, and those all have significant meaning. Um, but again, we're going for what is being, uh, w- what we're trying to take away within the context of this study is not the specific meaning so much because there's much for God to reveal along that line, but what is God doing? What is the overall process that's being met out uh, here? So back to verse 15, and then we'll try and finish up soon here. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. And he had just previously described those. Now he's going to describe... The measurement of the city. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. And he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as high and wide as it was long. And he measured its wall was 144 cubits thick. This is in reference to what Emmanuel just said. By man's measurement, which the angel was using. And the wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. And the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, and the fifth sardonyx, and the sixth carnelian, and the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, and the ninth topaz, and the tenth chrysoprase, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. And the great street of the city was of pure gold like transparent glass. Now we're going to come back into a further description of function. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So no temple. Why? Because as what was just previously said, God has made his dwelling to be in, with, and among the people. In their midst is what was said. So we're going to see it is the glory of God that gives it light. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light. And the lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Now, interestingly, when we're talking about the old order passing away, what was formerly a sign of reality or the reality to come will now no longer be needed. So in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. So we can look at that in two ways. We can say, oh, well, that's where we get day and night and years and months and things like that. We can also say that there are various seasons, days, and times appointed by God according to the fulfillment of his purpose. And that's really what we're seeing fulfilled here, especially in reference to because he continues there, he says, uh, and it was so, verse 16, God made two great lights, the greater light, the sun, 
to govern the day, and the lesser night, that being the moon, to govern the night. And he also gave stars. Now, here he says, the city does not need the sun or the moon. Those things that were formerly given to be signs in the heavens, that old order has passed. And now, what he said earlier, remember, it is done. It has now come to be. The new order has now come on the stage. And part of what this new order is, is that, obviously, the glory of God gives this city the light. There is no darkness in it. There is never darkness. What does this mean, though? What is the glory of God? Well, we've talked about this before as well in, in our previous studies. The, f- the, the, the glory of God, in, in one sense, is the fullness of God's wisdom in practice, okay, being put into practice as a way of life. And it gives off this light. What is light? That which reveals the heart and the purpose of God. So we've looked at John's writings again. He's very big on the theme of light and darkness. He says God is light. Light in the root meaning of the word mean, meaning that which reveals and he's always giving light. So here we have light and no darkness. So we, conti- we see that the God who is light, the God who is always revealing himself, is now making himself fully known in and through his people, through a way of life. So that what formerly gave light to mankind in the old order is no longer needed. Verse 24 says that the nations will, quote unquote, walk in its light. What is the light that the nations will see? Well, I'll tell you, they will see this practical expression or a culture of God's glory manifest in his people, the city, this bride. And this glorious, illuminating culture will be, it will ever be on display and the nations will pay tribute to it. So that's. Verse 24, the nations will walk by its light and the king of the kings of the earth will pay tribute to it. They will bring their splendor into it on no day will its gates ever be shut, pointing again to this perpetual function or order that is put in place by God. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. And the glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. In other words, again. The nations will pay tribute to it. That is in direct reference to many other prophetic words. Nothing impure will ever enter into it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those. So again, we have this culminating remark about the differentiation between those who had received the mark of the beast and have now come to the place of judgment. And now only those who whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, will be able to enter and or dwell in this city. So we covered a lot today, and we're going to finish there. Thank you for your attention. I hope that you have time to, to maybe meditate and reread some of those things, and, and not to gain knowledge for yourself, but to really settle in your mind and in your heart the, the, the glorious truth and reality of what God is uh, accomplishing, (laughs) bringing on to the stage uh, for his people, even in this day. Mm. We'll finish there. Bless the Lord. Beautiful, brother. Very encouraging, huh, to look at it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Amen. mm. Well, Brother Ben, I I don't want to grab you off a task, but I saw that you were able to join. Do you mind closing us in prayer? If you're available. Maybe not. Lige, will you close us, bud? Oh, wait, there's Ben. Did you come on? Go ahead, bro. I, I was just, I had to pull off gloves and Oh, no, we're so sorry about that. I figured I might catch you in the middle of something, but go ahead. All right. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the mighty truth of your revelation. Lord, we thank you for your word that penetrates, that pierces, Lord, that goes to the deep places. Lord, we thank you for the the encouragement in your spirit and the 
the empowerment, Lord, the grace that you have given to to walk forward, Lord, to fulfill the wonderful plans you have for your people and for your own glory. Lord, we desire to participate with you, Lord, to to take hold, to take to, to grasp the, the the depth and the breadth of what you have for each one. Lord, thank you that you know uh, the details of each one's heart and of their mind and of their spirit. Lord, we ask for, for each one that has ears to hear, that has a heart, that would be willing, that, that they would be encouraged to do so, or that there would be uh, an ever forward movement uh, and growth in your house, Lord, that indeed each each small delicate shoot would, would grow to be a mighty one, Lord, to provide shade and shelter for others, Lord, to, mm-hmm. to be a pillar in your house. Amen. So Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you, thank you for these brothers and these younger ones as well. Lord, I just ask for your continued hand on their lives and for them to, to have the hearts and the ears that are open to what you have to say. And Lord, bless their feet as they walk forward upon the path that you have made. Lord, bless your holy name today. Go before us this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. <laughs> wow. Thank you, guys. Yeah. That's beautiful, beautiful study, beautiful prayer. I'm not sure. A beautiful, quiet people there, so it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they're always pretty quiet. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. <laughs> I don't like people. So. Yeah. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, enjoy it. So. Well, bless you guys. We'll talk soon. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bless y'all. Bye. Bye, Elaine. The width and height and length is longer than 